World War II has been described as the Good War. Good because its causes were just and its results toppled fascism in Europe and ended the aggression of Imperial Japan. Over 16 million Americans served in the United States military during the war. Of that number, over 400,000 gave the ultimate sacrifice and over 600,000 were wounded. The millions who returned home bore the scars of battle, some of them visible, some of them not. The struggle of combat veterans readjusting to civilian life is the focus of our next film, The Best Years of Our Lives. The Best Years of Our Lives was released in the fall of 1946, one year after the war officially ended. Since it is a movie created during the time in which it portrays, we'll examine it solely as a primary source. The film came about when producer Sam Goldwyn, the G in MGM Studios, read a magazine article about the challenges faced by veterans returning home from the war. He hired a war correspondent to come up with a story that would become the script to The Best Years of Our Lives. To direct the film, Goldwyn turned to William Wyler, who was considered by his peers and by film historians as one of the greatest directors in cinema history. He was also no stranger to the effects of war. After the United States joined the Allies after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Weiler joined the Army Air Corps and lent his filmmaking talents to making training films and documentaries. Weiler and his crew flew deep into Nazi territory, and he suffered the loss of hearing in one ear as a result of bombing attacks. He left the service as a major of the Army Corps, and his footage is some of the most stunning primary source material we have of World War II. The Best Years of Our Lives opened to both public and critical acclaim, becoming the highest grossing film since Gone with the Wind. It won seven Academy Awards, including a statue to Weiler for Best Director, uh, also Best Picture, Best Actor, won by Frederick March, and Best Supporting Actor to Harold Russell, who portrays Homer. Harold Russell's Academy Award was particularly poignant in that Russell, like Homer, lost his hands while serving in the war. William Weiler had met Russell while working on a military training film, and Weiler chose him for the role of Homer despite Russell's complete lack of prior acting experience. The film centers on the dissonance between the celebratory golden age feeling of post-World War II America and the struggles and experiences of veterans. The plot follows three soldiers returning home. They each come from quite different socioeconomic backgrounds and represent different branches of the military. After sharing a plane ride home, the men become acquainted with each other and bond over their war experiences. While elated to be back home, all of them are apprehensive about how they will fit back into their lives that they left behind before the war. We meet Fred Derry, a former drugstore soda jerk, returning home as a decorated Army Air Corps bombardier. Al Stevenson, an upper-middle-class banker who served as an Army sergeant in the Pacific. And Homer Parrish, a young sailor returning home after having lost both of his hands in a submarine bombing. Their lives become increasingly intertwined as they work to reestablish their roles with their families and communities. More importantly to us as historians, their lives reveal the struggles surrounding post-traumatic stress disorder, disability, and depression in 1940s America. It also reveals the effects of the GI Bill of Rights, which was legislation passed by Congress at the request of President Franklin D. Roosevelt. It provided low-interest business and home loans to returning veterans, as well as paying three years' tuition and fees to state universities and vocational schools. The GI Bill is still in existence today, although its terms have changed somewhat over the years. In this sense, it's a valuable record of 1940s America. But how possible is it to accurately depict the era you're currently living in? Does it make the movie more reliable as a primary source or less so, considering who is missing from this meditation on the World War II veteran experience? 125,000 African Americans served overseas, along with tens of thousands of Asian Americans and Latinos, all of whom returned to a segregated, oppressive nation. There were also 400,000 American women who served with the armed forces during the war. And as you watch, consider all the recent films that have tried to portray the present-day veteran experience. How accurately and completely do they portray the 21st century? Are they more or less successful than the best years of our lives?